I just submitted my grad thesis at Hamburg University in Germany, and since it will become necessary for the groundwork of this channel when I return to the US and start producing content again, I believe it is time to share the most important idea that I've ever encountered in relation to Bible study. For me personally, I can't recall any concept that more dramatically sharpened my skill at biblical interpretation, literally overnight. What I'm talking about regards the following question. What is the Holy Spirit's role in interpretation? Now, I have found that most Christians assume part of the Holy Spirit's role is to function for the believer as their Bible commentary. I can't tell you how many times I point blank heard pastors teach this. Throw out all commentaries. Amen. Throw out all study Bibles. Yeah. You know, get just the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit comment on it. But, and let preachers, Spirit-filled preachers comment on it. But not books made by man to comment on it and to guide you. You should have a private Bible time where it's just you and the Lord and no one else. I believe the widespread popularity of this belief logically forces a great deal of churches to promote intellectual illiteracy as a mark of spiritual maturity. This occurs by reason of the following syllogism. Premise 1. It is spiritually mature to prioritize superior sources for Bible interpretation over inferior sources for Bible interpretation. Premise 2. The Holy Spirit is a superior source for Bible interpretation and intellectual publications are inferior sources for Bible interpretation. Necessarily, therefore, three, it is more spiritually mature to prioritize the Holy Spirit for Bible interpretation than intellectual publications. In other words, people who believe the Holy Spirit is a superior source for Bible interpretation are logically forced to view the prioritization of intellectual publications as immoral, as an act of spiritual immaturity. If you want to see a perfect example of this in the wild, we can look to a recent YouTube debate between Mike Jones of Inspiring Philosophy and a user by the name of G-Man. The topic of this debate was whether or not the long lifespans in Genesis are literal or symbolic. Immediately into his opening statement, Mike goes full nerd mode. He summarizes a recent doctoral dissertation on the topic, then starts machine gun firing off scads of scholarly arguments and comparative cultural analysis as he unpacks his case. It is clear that Mike prioritizes academic literature for understanding the meaning of the Bible. G-Man, on the other hand, doesn't believe academic literature is a priority for understanding the Bible. For him, the Holy Spirit takes eclipsing priority. G-Man produces no bibliography. He references no studies. Instead, he mainly just loudly read Sunday school level Bible verses at us over and over like we're a bunch of children. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It says that we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. What we not need? Study to show ourselves approved unto God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And the word of God is useful for correction. Okay? If the Bible is useful for correction and reproof, the Bible is useful for, for correction. Our Bibles tell us that our Bibles are useful for correction. A word may not, need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what it says. And you should hear what it's profitable for. Is it profitable for doctrine, for correction, and instruction in righteousness? I don't see anywhere in this where it says that, you know, that the word of God is good for scholars and good, no. Most significantly throughout this debate, he doesn't just disagree with Mike. Rather, he continually morally condemns him for his reliance on libraries and scholars as a spiritually immature deference to the word of man. Not, not scholars. You and your scholars and the Bible. Show me in the Bible. Open up your Bible right now. Well, I'm sorry. Open up your Bible right now and show me how you came to... And I, and I don't want to hear nothing else about another scholar. Can I read a passage in Scripture? We ought to obey God rather than man is God before scholars. No one studies the scripture by reading the Bible and then immediately going to scholars. They search the scriptures. They didn't quote scholars. I've got a scripture I want to read to you, inspiring philosophy about the days that we're living in. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, so they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Despite everyone lampooning him, I actually don't think G-Men is being irrational in this debate at all. Recall again our syllogism and you can appreciate that he was being extremely rational within his core two presuppositions. He had to morally scold Mike's prioritization of academic literature because he sees this as promoting spiritually immature hermeneutics. G-Man's attitude is probably the default of most American evangelical churches. And I'm going to tell you something else that bothered me. I, I, I don't know, I was just thinking, I was like, do you listen to the Holy Spirit? I simply say, does he listen to the Holy Spirit? You guys heard how he responded. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. Then we only have one teacher, and then it's the Holy Spirit. 
We can see a final example in yet another debate between Kent Hoven and Mike on Genesis. Throughout this debate, it was extremely obvious, again, that these two were from two totally different hermeneutical universes. Kent Hoven has dedicated most of his life ostensibly to defending and teaching Genesis. In my childhood, he was virtually the leader of the Young Earth creation movement in America. Despite all this, throughout the debate, Hoven continually voiced his ignorance of all the Genesis scholars and publications that Mike referenced. I refer to people like Michael Heiser, uh, J. Richard Middleton, um, Joshua John Van Ease, a guy I've just been reading recently, love his work, um, Robert E. Holmes, and I'm referring to the experts here. I don't want to be drawn back by Ken because I want to stay with the actual people who know the text, who know the Hebrew, who know what they're talking about. That's what <laughs> led me away from Kent. I even email John Walton when I'm able to because I want to know more about this. Let me answer it also if I could, please. Uh, he uses a lot of big names of supposed experts today. I've never heard of any of them. They may be expert in Hebrew. At one point in the Q&A, Hoven was asked a question about Klaus Vestamann, who wrote the most influential commentary on Genesis in the 20th century. Hoven stated point blank that he'd never heard of the guy. I don't who know Westerman is or what, uh, what he's talking about there. What we also learn that Hoven thinks that the Trinity is its enemy heresy of modalism, but I digress. I am a father and a son and a brother all at the same time, but I'm okay. only one person. That's modalism now. Are you a modalist? I don't, under, I don't think you understand the Trinity. You're describing it in modalist or partialistic ways, which is heresy. I don't know what you mean by this modalism and partialism. Again, Hoven believes the Holy Spirit is his Bible commentary, and that God has so ordained it that simply reading his King James is all that he needs. He doesn't bother to read textual scholars, and he apparently never even picked up an intro to theology book in his decades as a Christian leader, because research libraries are utterly superfluous to his interpretive methodology. In this video, I want to explain to you why the Holy Spirit isn't your Bible commentary, and why this belief is as unbiblical as it is highly destructive. Historically, the most critical text on the debate about the Holy Spirit's role in interpretation has been 1 Corinthians 2.14. Here Paul says to the church, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he is not able to know them because they are spiritually appraised. If you're like me, you grew up here in this passage invoked to mean that a person can't even intellectually comprehend the meaning of a Bible passage without being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is necessary to supply this comprehension. This may surprise most people, but the majority of conservative seminary textbook authors reject this interpretation, and for excellent reasons. Rob Stein is Senior Professor of New Testament Interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he has a PhD in New Testament from Princeton. First, he points out that there are several Greek words that Paul could have used in 1 Corinthians 2.14 when he says the natural man doesn't accept the things of God. Paul doesn't use the common Greek term lambano, which broadly and generically means to take. Instead, he uses the verb dechomai, which is more nuanced. In its 56 occurrences in the New Testament, dechomai always specifically refers to the acceptance of a requested offering. In other words, the natural man doesn't just fail to receive the things of the Spirit of God because he can't intellectually comprehend the message. Rather, the connotation of the Greek term is that he intellectually does receive the message, but he then chooses to reject its request. Second, as Stein additionally points out, the verb translated foolishness in this verse is also used again by Paul in the very next chapter, and in the one preceding. Does this Greek term refer to something being incomprehensible in that context? In 1 Corinthians 3.19 we read, quote, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Obviously, God intellectually comprehends the presumed wisdom of the world. But the reason that God rejects it as foolishness here, the Greek term moria, is that he doesn't accept it as true. His rejection of it is actually predicated on the fact that he comprehends it. For these reasons, as Larkin's study acknowledges, 1 Corinthians 2.14 assumes non-believers are indeed capable of mentally comprehending the Bible, and that it is actually this very capacity that causes them to dislike what it says, and to consciously reject its message. The late Roy Zuck, Senior Professor Emeritus of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary, also comes to this conclusion in his paper, The Role of the Holy Spirit in Hermeneutics. Quote, the verse does not mean that an unsaved person who is devoid of the Holy Spirit cannot understand mentally what the Bible is saying. Instead, it means that he does not welcome its message of redemption into his own heart. Besides being demanded by the Greek terminology, this interpretation of 1 Corinthians 2.14 is common sense. 
If the Holy Spirit is necessary to understand the Bible, then it would be impossible for religious Jews or atheists and agnostics to participate in serious Bible exposition or writing accurate technical commentaries. Yet we often find them producing some of the sharpest work in the field. Bart Ehrman, for example, the famous non-believing New Testament scholar, teaches university classes on the meaning of Jesus' parables. He does this for a living, and I listen to his lectures and derive great benefit from them because I recognize his intellectual understanding of them is clearly superior to mine. Similarly, I found that the Jewish scholar Robert Alter has produced what is probably the best translation of the book of Genesis in the English language. And many of the best journal articles on the Hebrew scriptures are written by Jewish Israelis since they speak Hebrew as their first language. Brent Osborne was professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. If you do graduate work at any evangelical seminary, at some point you'll probably have to read his massive classic work, The Hermeneutical Spiral. Again, recognizing all these points, he likewise belabors, quote, The Bible does not state that an unbeliever cannot intellectually interpret it quite accurately. So, Paul is claiming that the Holy Spirit's usual role resides in the subjective embracing and application of Scripture into a person's life, not in the grammatical, historical, cultural, nuts-and-bolts interpretation of its meaning. Surely Paul believes God could show you verses meaning supernaturally, just like he could supernaturally help you pass a school exam you haven't studied for, but that would literally be a miraculous exception, and you shouldn't count on it as if doing so makes you spiritual. It only makes you lazy. If a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, points at his New World Translation, and tells you in an airy voice that God impressed on his heart, that the grammar of John 1-1 doesn't say Jesus was God, but you assert on the same emotional grounds that it says the opposite, how can the stalemate be broken? Clearly, in order to sort out interpretive disputes, it has to be possible to appeal to objective things like Greek and Hebrew grammar, lexical study, historical cultural analysis, and ancient manuscript analysis. Reality doesn't care about your spiritual feelings. Using the Holy Spirit as an excuse for reading journal articles or a commentary isn't going to help you understand why the wheels in Ezekiel's vision were covered in eyeballs. Or what on earth Peter is getting at when he says in 1 Peter 3 that Jesus, quote, preached to the spirits in prison and the act of his crucifixion. It won't help you uncover why Paul says women should wear head covering specifically because of the angels in 1 Corinthians 11 or what the baptism of the dead is in 1 Corinthians 15. That method won't reveal you why Moses' wife in Exodus 4 saved Moses' life from the wrath of God by touching his feet with his son's freshly severed foreskin, pronouncing him a, quote, bridegroom of blood. You can pray for God to supernaturally reveal to you the meaning of all these passages all you want, but barring a miraculous exception to the Holy Spirit's usual role, the answer will not be found in that manner. Unspiritual? I claim the opposite. Expecting God to supernaturally drop the Greek clause structure or historical context of a passage into your lap without having to lift a finger to actually study it is like expecting God to supernaturally give you money, a healthy marriage, or a good exam grade without actually working for that either. The same all goes for John 16:13, which 3AM televangelists like to invoke when they're peddling slick theology. When John has Jesus telling the disciples in that verse the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth, the context refers to the disciples applying the memory of Christ's teachings for the establishment of the church. The Johannine expert Urban von Valde, professor emeritus of Loyola University Chicago, comments, When we look at the Greek grammar in that verse, quote, the reading favored by scholars would not assert that the Spirit will teach them all truth, but that his teaching will be in all truth, that is, will stand completely in the truth, end quote it's not legitimate to imply from passages like this that the Holy Spirit gives you immediate access without study of specialized resources to all the technical information or theological knowledge that you want concerning the Bible. Nor does it suggest that everything in the Bible even can be understood given our present state of knowledge. This brings me to a second implication. Christians often assume that pastors or theologians, who are especially virtuous, will, as a result of their godliness, be excellent sources for interpreting Bible passages that are culturally or linguistically abstruse. So, how should we understand Genesis 1-1? Let's consult Thomas Aquinas, who couldn't even read Hebrew. What are the gods mentioned in Psalm 82? A man as intimate with the Holy Spirit as John Calvin must know. Why does God speak in the plural when he says, let us make man in our image? If anyone's figured it out, surely a holy guy like Luther would know. Of course, I've chosen all these examples because they're all cases where we can prove that these men got it wrong. 
certainly not through some moral fault or spiritual or intellectual deficiency, but simply because they lack grammatical and archaeological extratextual data that's only been discovered after the 20th century for the most part. This is something that I wish theology nerds, especially seminary students, would get. The golden age of biblical interpretation wasn't with the patristic fathers. It wasn't with Augustine, it wasn't with Calvin, Luther, the Puritans, or the founding year denomination. After the opening of the 19th century, no one on earth could read Egyptian hieroglyphs. The great Mesopotamian libraries, like the vast majority of the over 130,000 cuneiform tablets currently sitting in the British Museum basement, remain buried in the desert until the middle of that century, and we've only yet translated a fraction of them. George Smith didn't translate and publish the Babylonian creation epic until 1876. It would be nearly 50 years before the French began excavating the library at Ugarit, or we gained our associated intimate knowledge of Baal worship, the primary religion that the Bible polemicizes against. The Dead Sea Scrolls wouldn't even be discovered until the end of World War II. It took astonishingly long before they were published, and contrary to what your Sunday school teacher may have told you, the Dead Sea Scrolls didn't match perfectly with the 1,000-year-old later medieval manuscripts that Old Testament translators had been using, particularly in books like Samuel and Jeremiah. It was only recently that high-resolution infrared images of the Dead Sea Scrolls have been made available worldwide to anyone with an internet connection, or the same has been done with thousands of ancient New Testament texts by the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. Using computerized linguistic databases, modern biblical scholars can even run syntax searches across the entire body of biblical and other ancient texts that would have been prohibitive for someone before the 20th century to conduct by hand. All of this is to say, the golden age of biblical interpretation is now. I'm not saying that we shouldn't study church history to gain perspective in our interpretations from the democracy of the dead. I'm merely pointing out that they didn't have access to the hundreds of thousands of lines of textual and iconographic context for the Bible that have been and are currently being discovered by modern archaeology, and we shouldn't be surprised if the Holy Spirit didn't supernaturally zap that information into their heads because that's not his usual role, barring literal miracles. It turns out moral virtue is independent of the ability to conduct historical linguistic analysis of Iron Age West Semitic religion and culture. Go figure. And when it comes to Bible passages that are technically difficult, frankly in my experience pastoral resources tend to be among the worst. My final point. People often abuse a Reformation doctrine called the perspicuity of scripture to claim that since God inspired the Bible knowing people in the 21st century would use it, must mean that he wrote it in such a way that all its contents would be non-obscure to people in the 21st century. This is incorrect, both as a representation of that doctrine, which is chiefly historically delimited to issues of salvation, and as a logical position. In fact, it has often been proven with modern advancements in linguistics and archaeology that Christians have occasionally misunderstood parts of the Bible for over a thousand years. In fact, that was kind of the point of the Reformation. The belief that the Holy Spirit is our Bible commentary has stagnated the church's maturity relative to the new influx of contextual data in the past two centuries, to an embarrassing extent. I'm the last to claim that we should simply bow to whatever scholars say like optimistic idiots. I only advocate that we cannot continue on philosophical grounds to stick our fingers in our ears and ignore them, as if that is a signal of spiritual maturity.